to the meat and potatoes of this, cybersecurity skills gap. Um, the word is a little bit long, uh, and the first thing that happens when we start talking cybersecurity skills gap is people, especially your technicians, uh, start to get uh, their feelings hurt a little bit, like, hey, I, don't, I have the skills, I can do this. And completely a true statement. So let's take the sting out of cybersecurity skills gap. And let's talk, describe what is actually going on here, right? By 2021, there are going to be 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs. Great for me, because i am already been doing it, so job security, I'm always going to have a job. It's fantastic. But the problem is, that's 3.5 million seats in a cybersecurity role that are 3.5 million people who are needed to defend an organization or defend a brand or protect and keep people safe or protect that intellectual property. What's even more terrifying is that number is going to grow by a, a rate of about 400,000 a year on afterwards. So that's a lot of jobs that are going to be open. There's a lot of empty seats that people need. Now, we're pushing out the, the you know, the, um, the educational machine is pushing out around 325,000 or so comp sci grads. Now, you don't have to have a comp sci degree to be inside of cybersecurity. But it was the closest one that lined up with what, uh, what we we're trying to talk about, and so we're rolling with it. About 325,000, 326,000. Now, you take all, and it's still not enough, but that's about where we are. The problem is, could you imagine a fresh college grad quarterbacking your IR? Nothing against college grads, but IRs are high-intensity situations. Or better yet, have them go up in front of your board and tell them how, to, how, you're going, how they're going to maintain your security and go against Russian and Chinese hackers and other threat actors who just want to steal and get money or credit cards or, protection, or protect people's uh, ident personally identifiable information. You need some experience there. You need some, you need some reps. Um, I've talked to a couple of IR consultants. They say it's a rep game doing like live responses, it's a rep game. You do it more than once, you start doing it a bunch of times, and as you do it, you learn more about it. So there's an experience piece there. This last thing, $150 billion in frustrated operating spends, the reason why I put this here is because you take people, because the cyber skills gap isn't just a skill thing. It's a skill plus tool thing. Um, we're familiar with the security world right now, right? There's a lot of tools out there. And there's a lot of tools that do a lot of things, and I don't know if all the things that they do are actually valid. <laughs> but what you end up with is you have these teams who are missing seats, who need experience, who are using a bunch of tools that may or may not actually solve the problem that they need to solve. And that is what the cyber skills gap is. Cool? So when we start talking cyber skills gap, you kind of understand what I'm saying here, right? Not enough people. Not enough trained people with the, maybe the wrong tool in their, in their pockets. So let's keep going. Um, so I'm going to break this up into two impacts. What, this is what the cyber skills gap does for two different people, or two types of people, right? I put CISO up there. Replace CISO with security manager. Your SOC manager, your, the manager of the security operations. It can be a VP of security. Like just security leader. A couple of things happen here whenever you have a significant cyber skills gap. One, maintaining talent acquisition and talent maintenance, like keeping those good people working for you, especially in the cybersecurity world, is tough. And so let's say you do get somebody that's good and they're rock stars and they're amazing. You have to deliver the business and keep them happy at the same time. And, you know, security guys tend to be a bit deepish sometimes. Right? Um, I know that I only had red and M&Ms behind the, uh, in the green room, so, no? <laughs> All right, so but getting that talent and maintaining that talent is actually really valuable. The other side here is management overhead. Um, manage this, the, the security manager is the person on the front line whenever something bad happens. I have never seen, and I, I go through a lot of news analysis, I have never seen a news analysis that says, well, that tier three analyst got fired because company X got compromised. Tier three analyst is never on that front line there. Their name never ends up in the paper. It is always the security manager's job, right? And so as you have these glaring deficiencies inside of cybersecurity and your program and delivering what you need to get delivered to be out there, the manager is the one who ends up on the front line, which causes 
all kinds of sleepless nights. You wake up in the middle of the night, you're like, oh, what about my DLP rules, right? Like, actually had that conversation at 3 o'clock in the morning with, with one of my customers. <laughs> and so you end up in this crazy situation where you don't have the right people, you have an impossible task, and if you don't do this impossible task without all of the right people and all the right tools, you will lose your job. So, man, who wants to be a manager of security? <laughs> but it's not just managers who have a higher time with the cyber skills gap either, right? Um, the actual practitioners, the guys and gals on the front lines and command prompts and the packet ninjas and the people who are reversing malware or doing you know, the threat intel, like they have some issues too. Um, I call this the circle of death. And the reason why I call it the circle of death is because it's an amazing circle. You can start anywhere on this circle and it will feed into the next step. And it's always a true statement. Like we can pick any place on this circle and it will feed into the next, next step. And then you'll end up back at where you were initially. So, for instance, <clears throat> one of the things that I find very hysterical, because I came up as an attacker, I came up on the red side of the house. Um, and as, you, as, a red, as a guy on the red side of the house, a guy who's breaking things, I have one job. I break things. I don't have to patch anything. I don't have to file a TPS report. I don't have to do anything but break things. And it's either, did it break or did it not break? That's a yes, no. That's a zero or a one. And I can kind of break it and get kind of credit, but you know, we call that a degradation tool, not a you know, breaking tool. So let's take less time for critical tasks. Because one of the things that I find absolutely hysterical is the amount of time the average defense practitioner spends doing not security work. Right? You have all of these people, you have all of these tools, and I see some heads nodding at me, so there's some people who've been in the security business for a little while who spend more time writing emails and trying to explain what a packet is or a three-way handshake is to people who you know, just need to give you what you need to get your job done. Right? Um, but let's say less time for critical tasks. Right? So what I mean by that is you don't have the ability to deliver the security effects that you want to deliver. And so if you don't have the ability to deliver the security effects that you want to deliver because you have to do all this overhead stuff, um, you're not actually doing security work. And if you want to be a security professional but you're not doing security work, you get really frustrated with your job. And that leads to a high burnout rate because you're doing things that just drain you. I love security. I can spend 19 hours a day doing security. I do not like writing reports. It's part of eating your vegetables. It's something you got to do. But if I had to write reports for 19 hours, I think I'd rather be a taste tester for Clorox. Like, it's just not a good, it's not a good fit for me, right? And so um, it leads to the burn. You burn yourself out if you're doing things that don't fit in your flow. And if you, have a, if you start to burn out, you've seen the guy who's burnt out. They don't do as good of a job. And if they're not doing as good of a job, then the security gets even more lax, and now you have a breach. And once you have a breach, you now have more work to do. And if you have more work to do, guess what? You have less time for critical tasks. And that, my friends, is the circle of death. And this is what happens whenever you don't have the right butts and the right seats and the right tools, or we call it the cybersecurity skills gap. So how do we do, what do you do with this, right? This first part of the call, or first part of the conversation has been real doom and gloom. It's kind of sad. Well, there's hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Ta-da! FireEye ecosystem, right? No. I'm joking, but it's serious. Like, there's this, I, there's this concept of services and intelligence and technology, and you mush all that stuff together, and then you say, here you go. This is security. This is how you make things better. This is how you fix the problem that you have. And so the, the hub there for us is managed defense. So people often ask me, hey, Stanley, you're an MDC. What do you actually do? It's very simple. I keep my clients safe. So I'm an attacker. This is the world I live in. Either I did a good job or I didn't do a good job. It's binary for me. I keep my clients safe. My service, our service, is there to keep our clients safe, and that's how we roll. So how do we do that? Intelligence is everything. Intelligence is the baseline of how we function. From intelligence, we do proactive hunting where we go through and look for evil in people's environments, where there are no IOCs. We just have, we're literally walking into an environment and saying, hey, our smart people are better than their smart people, and we'll find you. And we do a pretty good job of it. 
From there, we also do alert prioritization. So we get these alerts in, we come back and we say, hey, this is actually real. You need to do some type of response to this, and this is how you respond to it. Or this isn't real, it's fake. It actually doesn't matter, just check, just keep going. It's not a thing. False positive, um, something just so happens to look evil. The things that actual legitimate companies do, or like legit companies developers do. Um, there was once a patch for a, um, uh, web framework, and they included a PHP script that was called ph passwords.php, and it was the encryption bit for passwords. It caused so many false positives <laughs> because you see something that's called passwords PHP, and you're like, web shell? It was actually legitimate. It was supposed to be there. But, you know, you see those types of things all the time. And then on the other side, the last thing we do is we respond. My customers or my, the people I'm working with, I keep them safe, but sometimes stuff happens. Misconfigurations happen. People, you do have users, and users like to click on stuff, no matter how many times you tell them not to. And if they click on something, you need to be, be able to respond. And so every response, I am with my customers the whole way through. And they never do it alone, right? And because this is what I do, it's a nice warm blanket. I mean, who doesn't want to call me at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, hey, there's a compromise? There we go. Okay, so the other point here is, yes, they call me, but there's a lot of really smart people that work on my team, that work with us to deliver this service. We have some of the best talent in the world because we have the coolest, bestest security problems. And so the way you address the cyber skills gap is you take really highly motivated people doing things they love to do, and you let them only do those things. Our Intel folks only do Intel. Our re incident responders only incident respond. Our reverse engineers only reverse engineer. We just do it for everybody, everywhere. And because they're happy and because they're doing really cool things, we're able to address that problem for you.